Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and good, good morning. Alan, thank you for the warm introduction, and Scott, for the warm welcome. I appreciate everybody coming out this morning at this, uh, it really is night. It's incredibly early. And I, I hope you don't mind if I clutch my coffee while I, uh, while I uh, talk with you. Um, and I hope that what we can have is some conversation, which is what I much prefer to, to having me talk, uh, uh, talk at you. I have uh, a little bit of background on, uh, on the program. Um, and the 18 months, uh, I guess it's been a, not quite a, has it been more than a year? You're 14 months in, is that right? Jillian, where are you? You graduate in May? You all graduate in May. So you've been together for a long time now. Yes. And you, uh, you are all mid-career. You've come from other, uh, from other things. You've, uh, not right? Some of you are. Now. You're graduates. All right. Well, I was going to observe that um, as accomplished as you all are, you still do what students do, which is sit, in most cases, as far away from the <laughs> professor as, uh, as possible. So when we get to conversation, I will be coming to you. <laughs> you cannot hide. We did the Socratic method at Harvard Law School, and I remember it. So uh, just, I notice your eyes will slide away, but I'm still going to ask you. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to ask you questions. Um, I was asked to, to uh, say a little bit about uh, my current gig, which is uh, at Bain Capital. As uh, Alan was saying, uh, we founded a new private equity fund, a middle market fund, uh, that is about uh, investing in lower middle market companies all in North America for both financial return and social measurable social or environmental uh, impact. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got, how I got interested in this, and. Um, uh, and what we are what we are doing, and then I will stop. And we can yes. Can I ask what the name of the fund is? It's called uh, Bain Capital Double Impact. Thank you. Yeah, it's closed right now, but I'll let you know uh, when we reopen for fund two. We would be welcome to have. Uh, we would welcome your investments. Um, we um, so I got interested in so-called impact investing in my old job as governor of Massachusetts, and I was introduced to a uh, a fellow named Sir Ronald Cohen a very successful regular way private equity investor in the UK who had then moved on to create something called social impact bonds. I don't know if any of you uh, are aware of this tool. And the notion is that um, private equity, com I'm sorry, private capital comes in alongside government. Sometimes they're described as pay for success contracts. Uh, comes in alongside government to, to innovate, to try something, uh, try something new. And, uh, uh, Sir, Sir Ronald was coming through the states explaining this concept to various sitting mayors and governors uh, when I was in office, and I got jazzed about it um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because for all of the interest I think we all have in, uh, in innovation in public policy, and indeed I would say innovation is as important in public policy as it is in today's uh, global economy, um, to have successful innovation, you have to raise your tolerance for failure. And politics punishes failure. So you get less innovation than you might like because the consequences of it not going beautifully the first time um, will cost political people uh, their jobs or careers. I had the great advantage um, having run for one thing. Um, that I could focus on the job rather than, my, uh, rather than my career. And so the notion of having a laboratory where you, you could try some new things um, was pretty exciting. And this, the notion is pretty simple. You, you, uh, there's a, um, a design of a project or an initiative that would save public money by trying to solve a problem a different way. In our case, we did uh, the first two in, uh, uh, around uh, individual chronic homelessness and at-risk uh, uh, youth recidivism. And you use this uh, uh, strategy to prove out whether there's a better way to reduce, to get better results, first and foremost, and to reduce costs to, uh, to the public. And if it works, the bondholders get paid from the savings, not all of the, sav the savings, but a portion of the savings. And then you have a proof point which you can bring to the legislature uh, to, uh, to think about more radical or scaled uh, uh, change. It's early days, um, but the, uh, the early uh, feedback has been, has been uh, encouraging. Um, Sir Ronald then went on to create something called Bridges Ventures, which is a, uh, an, an early stage 
impact fund, same thesis, which is um, market uh, level or style returns, financial returns with measurable uh, uh, impact. And uh, I met him uh, again not long before I left office. And I said, how long have you been at this now? He said, four or five years. And I said, have you got any exits? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what sort of returns are you getting? And he said, well, if our conventional funds are yielding uh, 18, 19 net, we're getting 17, 18 from our impact funds. And I said, what? And he said, well, yeah, that's the point. He said, I'm trying to demonstrate that um, you don't have to trade return for impact. So all my antenna went up. Um, I, uh, I left office uh, not entirely sure what I wanted to do and uh, investigating impact investing in the states then. So this is early 2015. And I think it is fair to say that the field is more mature in Europe than it is here in the, uh, in the States. And so I, as I was looking around, I didn't see a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities that made sense for, for me as someone who is not a conventional uh, and experienced uh, private equity investor. I have some pals at, uh, at Bain Capital who had, were, had offered to you know, sort of be coaches for me, uh, give me feedback as I was thinking about uh, my next things. And I went to see a couple of them. Um, about something I had uh, settled on in New York. And uh, I remember one of them, Steve Pagliuca, um, reacted to the description of what I was uh, thinking about doing. And he said, you know, that sounds great. He said, but you don't really sound passionate about that. What are you, what are you really passionate about? And I started to talk about impact investing. And he sat back and said, I can't believe you brought that up. And I said, why? He said, because we've been trying to figure out as a firm how to get into that space for some while now because our LPs, our investors from Europe, have been asking for these products, as you might imagine. So he said, why don't you come in and help us figure it out? And uh, so I joined the firm in, uh, uh, in April of 2015. Uh, it was actually kind of funny, because it took us about two days to work out the terms and two weeks to figure out how to announce it, um, for reasons that some of you can imagine. Um, we, uh, I spent about a year with borrowed talent from other parts of the, uh, of the firm working out the business plan, really trying to understand what the white space was for a firm like ours in this space in North America, having decided that that would be our, uh, the geographic footprint for our, first, uh, for our first fund. And also what um, types of companies were likely to yield enough deal flow for us to prove out what it is we were trying to, uh, uh, to do. And so we decided that we would start small, a $250 million fund, which to me is a lot of money. At Bain Capital, it's quaint. You know, it's, it's charming. Um, we, uh, you know what I mean. Um, but again, the notion was nail the model and scale from there. Uh, and uh, um, uh, and, we, so, and we, we, we elected um, to do as I said, lower middle market uh, investing, but later stage, because most of the impact investing in the States is venture and other early stage. And what we were finding is that lots of entrepreneurs who are mission driven and were growing fast could attract capital, but that the next investor was more interested uh, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the financial dimension and less so the mission, which is to say, as one entrepreneur put it, we sell on, but then we sell out. And what we're interested in is, is scaling the whole thing, the whole idea. Um, we decided that we would invest along three broad thematic verticals, sustainability, health and wellness, and what we're calling uh, community building. So by sustainability, we, we're interested in uh, sustainable consumer goods, in alternative uh, uh, and uh, alternative energy and energy uh, efficiency, water uh, efficiency, um, that kind of thing. By uh, health and wellness, we're interested in uh, affordable health care, including behavioral health. We're interested in, um, uh, in nutrition and wellness uh, generally. Uh, also in that category, ed tech companies whose products or services are about closing achievement gaps or skills gaps, which is a, the latter in particular a huge problem, uh, challenge in this country. And then community building is more of a place-based strategy. So it's <coughs> companies that are intentional about um, creating jobs and catalyzing economic activity in places of chronic 
underemployment. And I can give you examples uh, of, uh, of each of these. We've done four investments so far. We closed on $390 million, um, and it was still, the demand was still coming, but we said, you know, let's stop. Um, we decided to up the, the, uh, um, the cap a little bit because we were seeing enough opportunities where the check size warranted for control stakes was a little bigger than what we had originally uh, uh, anticipated. We have a, um, a team now of 15 full-time investors, most of them transfers from other Bain Capital uh, funds. And I was very intentional about gathering around me people who had investment uh, experience. Um, and we underwrite to exactly the same financial standards as our large cap um, fund, which will be on the minds of many of you. And we're, uh, and we're measuring um, impact uh, at an entry level and as we go against goals that we set for our uh, portfolio companies and also as a, uh, as a fund. So it's early days. We closed the fund a year, uh, a year ago this spring, yes. And as I said, we've done four deals. I hope we will sign another today. Please wish us luck. Um, and uh, yeah, we're off to the off to the races. Is that enough That's great. to get it going? Does that is that generally descriptive? Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, advice? Can you yeah. Talk a little bit about the companies that you guys have found. Yeah. Found? Yeah. So the first one um, we did was a, a company called Impact Fitness, uh, which is actually now a Planet Fitness franchise. And they target, uh, it's a company in, uh, in uh, uh, Michigan and northern Indiana, which has targeted um, communities where there is a high incidence of obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and so on. It, uh, health issues related to um, fitness. And, um, and they've made the model work in those places, um, unlike anybody else. So if you think of the con conventional economics of a gym, it's charge as much as possible and hope nobody comes, right? Because <laughs> you're all nodding because we, right? This is the inverse. It's, it's, you know, 10 bucks a month and we're driving utilization and we are beginning to measure the number of times, for example, a week that you get your heart rate rate up. We're sharing that with the um, health insurers, obviously with consent, and the health insurers will subsidize the, uh, the rates. 40% cash on cash return is very, very profitable, very profitable. Uh, and, uh, and we've made uh, one add-on acquisition of a, another territory, and we'll, uh, we'll add another probably by the end of, it's March now, by the end of, uh, by the end of March. It's really, really going well. We're sort of the test, test kitchen for the Planet Fitness um, uh, um, you know, company because uh, as a company, they're, I wouldn't say saturated, but they're in a lot of, they're in a bunch of places where there's a large concentrations of population. They haven't cracked this code, and we have. So it's a very valuable franchise within that, um, within that system. The second is a company that is, uh, I, I would describe as inherently impactful. It's the largest um, uh, company of its kind in Texas. Who's my friend from Texas? Where are you? You, right. I'm sorry. That was you. Sorry. Um, it's a company in Houston and uh, largely in Houston and Dallas called Living Earth. And they divert um, organic waste, you know, yard clippings and uh, stuff that the, you know, the road crews clean up from the highways from landfills where it would otherwise decompose and create CO2 to, uh, to compost. And they sell it back as, um, as uh, composted soil or, or mulch, ridiculously profitable. And, uh, and we've added a, we just bought a company in Tennessee to expand that. And we're looking to create, to basically roll up a bunch of similar companies or establish this practice across the Southeast, and mostly the Southeast because of the length of the, of the growing season. We've got a little bit of setback from the, from the hurricane, um, but uh, the recovery was pretty quick. And I think, you know, as, uh, as folks start to, you know, repair their grounds um, from the from the damage. Now that the growing season comes, we'll we'll uh, we'll come back strong. The the third company is I won't go into all of the the companies in great detail, but the third company is a sustainable um, uh, restaurant, small restaurant chain, um, very much about the sustainability of the supply chain and the wellness of the food um, served, and that's a that's a trend. 
nationally that we're investing um, uh, behind, and it's already its returns are already pretty impressive. So, yeah, is that a, enough of a flavor? Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you this would qualify as an alternative investment. So, is this for qualified investors, or can the public? No qualified investors. Right. Right. Minimum minimum to come in was five million. It's a it's a it's conventional private equity. Same same uh, fees and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excuse so, me. And when you say conventional, two and twenty. Yeah, I guess I'm not supposed to say, but I, no, that's okay. I, I, but um, I, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Maggie. My background: I'm a 2004 graduate of the program, and mm -hmm. I spent 10 years at the Kauffman Foundation, four years on the Kauffman Fellows Program. Yeah. Um, you guys are doing a lot in this space now. I mean, Kaufman is. is. I'm not with, I, okay. Uh, most recently, with an organization based in San Francisco called Portfolio yeah. that builds micro VC funds okay. to engage and activate female accredited investors. Okay. So I stood up four, three funds, three small funds for them, and now have come back and focused on Kansas City and am putting together a five million dollar seed capital fund mm -hmm. for the Enterprise Center at Johnson County. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, my questions were more around. Um, Average size investment, geographic restrictions. Yep. So we are writing, uh, figure, 10 to $40 million equity checks, 5 to $15 million EBITDA companies. We would go smaller. We want to be cash flow positive. We would invest in a company that had a line of sight to cash flow positive in, you know, 18 months, let's say, yeah. um, but that was growing really, uh, really fast. We prefer a control position. In one case, we have not done that, um, but we have enough um, influence. But you know, there's control, and then there's control. It's 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 not so much we have to have 51 percent or more, but there has to be alignment with what it is we're trying to build and where we're trying to go, um, including on the on the measurement piece. And uh, um, yeah, I think. And the, uh, you said you asked about geographic uh, focus. Mm -hmm. it, the first fund is North America. The and that was. That was um, not without a lot of debate um, because there is a lot of unmet need and actually a lot of activity in emerging markets, um, but it's a new team and we're active. We want to be active partners and not just you know, board, um, board meeting partners, if you know what I mean. And we thought the team should be together because it's new. So we're all or almost all of us in Boston. And we thought we should be within easy reach of the team because we're all um, together. So we decided we'd stick to North America for fun one. Nice. And so mostly seri like Series C, Series D investments. Yeah, we're later so stage. Way, way much later. Yeah, yeah. It could, you know, we it's it's it's. Um, I mean, think of buyout, but in almost every case, the uh, actually I, I take that back. In every case, the founder has rolled okay. all or some. And is stuck with us, um, so you you know what it's like. You you you're yeah, investing I'm in people. No, I get it, I get it. But <laughs> similar, <laughs> but <laughs> but similarly, you're investing yeah. in the team, right? In the Absolutely. management team. So that's it's yeah. we're we're not going in to run the companies, uh, but to but to uh, but to help. Super interesting. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And we can talk about anything. We don't have to talk about uh, impact investing. Yes, ma'am. I should have asked you all to say your name and tell me a little bit about you as. As you did, Margaret. Um, when you're looking at funds, do you um, weigh the considerations of political implications? I I'm not sure exactly how to ask. Yeah. It seems like there could be some political implications on what you choose to invest. I, so I don't know. I don't think so. Um, you know, we get asked questions like, well, you know, would you invest in clean coal, for example? Um, if there is such a thing, um, and we have, you know, we haven't confronted that. We haven't said categorically no. If if that's the kind of thing you, you're yeah. getting at, you know, we have. Uh, I, I think I, I don't know if it's I, maybe this is small p political. It's really important to me that there be impact integrity, and that it's not just marketing. Um, that so you know, there's a you could, as I say, there. I described uh, Living Earth as a company that's inherently impactful. It's in their business model. Um, they, are, they don't think of themselves as an impact 
enterprise or mission enterprise, but what they are doing is inherently impactful. That's a pretty easy call. There are companies, um, and maybe, maybe in a way, uh, impact fitness is like this, where it's more managed impact. There is something we are trying to do to make it impactful. I described um, when we were uh, shopping the fund to uh, investors my hypothetical, my hypothetical widget company. You know, nothing inherently impactful about widgets. And let's say that widget company um, has an old and out of date manufacturing facility. And we say, we're going to own that widget company and we're going to cause that widget company to build a LEED certified manufacturing facility and we're going to put it in the south side of Chicago where I grew up as a way to bring people from the margins of the economy into the main street, as Method Soap did, by the way. And I would, I would argue that is a wildly impactful investment. It's intentional, right? You know what you're trying to um, uh, accomplish and whom you're trying to uh, impact and you can, and you can measure it. Um, so we're very open to that kind, of, uh, that kind of investment. I don't know if you know this company, um, Shinola. Do you know the, anybody know Shinola? The, you do, yeah. Shinola um, is a, they make watches and leather goods and so on. It's a, uh, uh, they, they established themselves in downtown Detroit on purpose because they wanted to be a part of the revival of downtown uh, Detroit. And, uh, and they've had a huge impact in the, in the community around Wayne State, if you know that, that area, as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, Chris Longley, class of 2013, Merrill Lynch. Um, so do you have a sub-thematic uh, for ESG, environmental, social governance, like uh, that these companies you're looking at, mm -hmm. you know, you have two companies, um, but one has a female CEO. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any weighting towards that as a, another impact investing side? So far, we haven't had to make that choice. Um, and I'm, I think, so there's a, what, we've, what we use as the kind of foundational tool is something called the GEARS survey, which comes out of B-Lab. You follow B corporations at all? Uh, beneficial corporations? Any of you know what I'm talking about? It's a, it's a, it's actually a pretty hot trend um, where you can either register or certify as a B corporation in I think f 40 states now. And a B corporation means that you are, um, by law or certification, taking account of multiple stakeholders, shareholders being one, but also community stakeholders, employees, and so on. And the gear survey captures the, G, uh, the ESG features. So we're, we're rating, um, we're, that's our, as I say, sort of, that's our sort of going in measure. Uh, and we get our baseline measure uh, using, uh, uh, using that. So I, I guess I would say ESG is, in, is incorporated. And you get a higher score if you, yeah. Second question, are you running for president? Not today. <laughs> Are you interested in running for governor in non-Massachusetts states like Kansas or Missouri? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, uh, any other questions? <laughs> I, I've been, I've, I've, uh, I've run for one thing. You know, I spent most of my life in the private sector. Um, I was an executive at Coca-Cola and at Texaco and in private practice and, um, at private law practice before that. Uh, I had one public gig as head of the Civil Rights Division in the Clinton administration. Um, but I hadn't run for office um, before governor in Massachusetts where I've lived um, for most of the last um, 40 years, 45 years. And uh, I, was, I, I ran in part because a very, very bad habit I've seen in business um, which is this quarter-to-quarter -quarter management, the short-termism, the, the, the um, I think sometimes uh, at the risk of the long-term interests of the enterprise. I think that bad habit has crept into the way we govern in this country. We govern from election cycle to election cycle or news cycle to news cycle and not generation to generation. And I wanted to see whether it was possible to... Um, to govern that way, and to um, uh, and to and frankly to get elected um, with that notion that we weren't going to that the promises I was trying to um, I was trying to deliver on wouldn't be promises necessarily that we would deliver on in in uh, in four or eight years uh, time. I should say we don't have term limits. 
I have a term limit named Diane, <laughs> who said uh, two terms and that's, uh, and, and that's it, which is part of my answer to Alan when he <laughs> asked me in 2016. <laughs> but uh, but I, I will say that, uh, you know, we had, we, had, uh, we had expected challenges, like, you know, there's never enough money for all the stuff you want to do and never enough flexibility, back to the innovation uh, point. Um, and then unexpected things like a global economic collapse or a terrorist attack at the Boston Marathon. Um, and I am, I am proud of the fact that uh, when, when we left, we were first in the nation in student achievement, in economic uh, entrepreneurialism, in, uh, uh, in veteran services, energy efficiency, healthcare coverage, 99% of our residents are insured. Um, we had the highest bond rating in the history of the Commonwealth. Uh, our bu budgets were responsible, 25-year employment high. We got a lot of good stuff done. We didn't get it all right. Joan's here from Massachusetts, so I, I know you're going to call me out. Um, we, di we didn't get it all right, but, uh, but we, um, and we, 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 we got in a kind of a groove about how, you know, we can, we can actually make some hard decisions that are not about us as much as they are about our grandkids. Uh, and I'm proud of that. Um, so as I, I think about the, about the future, I'm, re I'm really focused on, on this right now. It's important. it's important to me, it's important to the firm, and it's important to me, if I do go back into politics, that this be real um, and, uh, and, and succeed. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about 2020, but it's, it's, a, it's so hard to think about that it's easier to think about this. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, government, how, how do you drive the conversation? You know, how, how do we as business people help drive that conversation um, away from the quarter to quarter outlook and more towards generational? Yeah, so did you see Larry Fink's letter, his uh, investor's letter? You know Larry Fink? No. He's the head of, uh, of BlackRock, um, which is, you know, a behemoth of a. Uh, I do know yeah, so he sent a, an investor's letter, um, which got a lot of news this spring, to, um, I think it was the investor's letter, about how to think in fresh ways about, about long-term value. And that long-term value um, has to include environmental and social impacts of the kind we've been talking about um, uh, today. And by the way, I think that is factually true. That's not just a, um, a, a nice thing. I, in an age of ubiquitous imp information, to me, it's unrealistic to think you can manage to the financial bottom line all alone. Because if you mess up environmentally or socially, it will come back to bite your financial bottom line. And basically what he's saying is there has to be a a way to think about American capitalism today that is um, broader and is more, it, it takes account of all of the uh, consequences and, and, and essentially said, and that is what he's going to be looking for as the largest investor, maybe the largest investor in the world. There was a guy, there's a guy named um, Mark, um, CEO of Aetna. Can't remember his last name. Yes. Yes, thank you. This will happen to you one day. Um, <laughs> they are um, they're merging with uh, CVS now, and Mark is leaving at the end of the at the end of the merger. And uh, we were on the phone, um, and he told me he was at some fancy New York thing with a bunch of other captains of industry, and uh, everybody in black tie. And he got up to give his remarks, and he said, "We're all sitting here clueless." said he, uh, and you know, the place went quiet, and he said, because capitalism is under attack. Uh, and he went on to talk about how millennials, um, an overused term, but millennials emerged from college having done everything right, right in the middle of the economic collapse, and it has shaken their confidence in, uh, in capitalism. And they are insisting on a broader notion of what um, value means. And that his point was, I, I don't go this far, but his point was, if you don't figure out a broader definition of value, and measure it, by the way, um, that capitalism is in, uh, is in jeopardy. 
I, like I say, I don't go quite that uh, far yet, but there's something to that. And you know, at, we, when we went to see Kaufman and other, other foundations, the foundations are feeling enormous pressure to be thinking about how to use not just the mission MRI, mission-related investments, not just the program side, but the, but the endowment side yeah. Yeah. to uh, invest alongside their, uh, uh, their values. And I think it's pretty exciting stuff. Some are doing really, like Red Herring, is it Red Herring Foundation? Someone has totally aligned their... Heron. Heron, Heron Foundation. Foundation, yes. 100%. Yeah, right. really interesting. I mean, it'll be, you know, it'll be good to see how that plays out. Yeah. Because it could prove the model. Yes. Um, I'm Christine Murray. I work for the Greater Kinsey Chamber of Commerce here. Um, and we did a, a leadership exchange trip to Boston this year. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that was so interesting, so I'm going to kind of combine the government and the Bain Capital question together, but mm -hmm. there's so much innovation. Um, and culturally, even like the DOT was right. talking about how do you do things differently? You don't just look at 50 year planning. Right. How do you, as a, for a cultural perspective, whether it's entrepreneurship, which I also work on, how do you get people to start thinking differently? Um, is that just something that's in the water there? Um, how do you get <laughs> people to start thinking, like, this is just because we've always done something this way, we shouldn't just keep doing it this way, whether it's from a government perspective yeah. or finding new investors and getting them to think about investing differently yeah. or ROI differently. Yeah. How do you, how do you, or did, was there an evolution of cultural change or is that just something that was part of the DNA there? I think, I think, um, I think it's probably a combination of both, but it doesn't mean it's it's uh, it is or needs to be unique to to Boston or Massachusetts. I mean, we have some we have some advantages in a in a in an increasingly knowledge based global economy because there are three hundred colleges, universities, research institutions, teaching hospitals within a forty five minute drive of downtown Boston. It's an incredible concentration of brain power. Right. Um, but we do not have, or we didn't have, very well developed the collaborative gene. So folks, you know, and MIT did their thing, but they didn't talk to folks at Harvard or at MGH or, or what have you. And we, we, we tried to do a bunch of things that kind of mashed communities together. So we had something called a life sciences initiative. Because we had all the tools for the biotech um, industry, and we had a... We had a good biotech um, industry, but what we hadn't done is concentrate on how to strengthen it and grow it um, as a job creation mechanism. Um, because we had all these, you know, we had all these uh, sort of um, um, natural resources. And I would make the point, you know, we should invest in education in Massachusetts the same way, you know, Texas invests in. Uh, in the extraction industry, or Iowa invests in corn. It's our natural resource. But I got hammered um, by bunches of people who said, you know, government shouldn't be picking winners or losers. And I get that point, because I'd always make the point, we're not picking losers. Um, but, uh, you know, the legislature and the business community and the science uh, community and the med medical community came together. They didn't normally come together. And, uh, and we tried something. Um, we invested, we, it was a billion dollars over 10 years. I think we've invested about a half a billion. That has gener generated three or four billion dollars in private invested, investment, created thousands of jobs. It was one of a handful of industries that lifted us out of recession faster than most states. You know, we had, we'd been on, a, on an ed education journey for a long time. But we had the same debates, tiresome debates, between the district schools and the charters and the city and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the suburbs and the conversations around um, education um, uh, sort of theorists and, and scholars and the business community about you know, what the purpose of education was and are we preparing employees or are we preparing citizens? And we, uh, you know, it's like, come on. We yeah, got all these for, folks together, for and us, like I, I, I wasn't surprised to see the educational institutions were, were innovative. But yeah. I think it was more of your traditional institutions yeah. that seemed to be very innovative, and the the the, pre, the number of kids who are in pre K, yeah. and yeah. I mean, it's just sort of thinking forward. And we just keep we just keep trying stuff. And I this is to the point I was making earlier about your willingness to to fail. I mean, it's it's for me it was easier because as I said, it wasn't my. 
it wasn't my career. I, um, um, so I could focus on the job. So, Java, yeah, excuse me. Uh, oh, so I've, been in, I've, I've spent a lot of time in this space for um, about 10, 12 years. And what you describe that you're investing in at Bain now mm -hmm. looks a lot like European social enterprise. Mm -hmm. right? So they're businesses that have that natural double bottom line. But what about part of the reason they can operate in Europe is the gov the welfare state is so much bigger, mm -hmm. right? So there are a lot of areas that aren't as that aren't being served by the private sector there because the government's serving them. Well, here we we don't have as big of a welfare mm -hmm. state, and so you still have significant areas of need in communities where the private sector, in the form of nonprofits traditionally or some for profits, yep. are, are coming in that aren't going to be revenue aren't going to have great revenue streams. Yep. Right? You actually started out talking about social impact bonds. I mean, this, you know, the, those aren't industries that typically have big revenue streams. They're, the savings is in the cost savings. Exactly. So, so um, is, there, is there an appetite at Bain? Is there, do you see a future with what you're doing at Bain um, where you will start maybe tackling what we would call wicked problems, um, some of the more wicked problems also mm -hmm. that kind of fall in this market failure area mm -hmm. of, of social problems when you think of like housing issues, mm -hmm. and like you grew up in the south side of Chicago, right? mm -hmm. I and mean, housing's always been one of those big issues. Mm -hmm. the south side was famous for, with the project. Right, you know? yeah. I mean, so I, it's a very long, uh, convoluted question, but the idea of, do you see this moving to some more of those complicated uh, systemic issues mm -hmm. that can be solved even for companies that are, even for ideas that would be low profit ideas or uh, limited profit ideas? For us, yeah. no. Um, and I, 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 should be, I should be clear, that it doesn't mean that it won't happen in the space or under the rubric of uh, impact investing. I don't think any one um, model um, needs to be thought of as exclusive of all others. You know, there's a, I, we, are, we are trying to demonstrate at scale that you don't have to trade return for impact because as we demonstrate that, I think it presents some pretty important questions for investing generally, um, but there's still room for social impact bonds. There's still room for, um, for the many, many investors who are willing to take a concessionary return uh, or, uh, or you know, just to get their capital back. There's a whole spectrum. Uh, there's room for that. I will say there is, and this sort of to the innovation uh, question, there's a model that I'm really interested in that I haven't actually seen in real life but that was described to me by someone around, around the housing uh, or, or, or real estate development. We decided, we looked at real estate, we decided not to do it, and in particular affordable housing, because it, wouldn't, it didn't meet our return profile, and it rarely does. Yeah. Um, but um, there's a developer I met who talked about this pattern. He said, now, do you know Boston at all? You know Roxbury? So think Roxbury is a is a poor poorer neighborhood uh, in uh, in Boston. It's you know Boston is tight and small, and um, so you can walk to everything. But uh, but few people walk to Boston. There's been very little development in Roxbury um, um, for lots of old tarnished reasons. And um, he said, you know what? If I go to Roxbury today, and I want to put up a let us say. 14-story building. Roxbury is mostly low. He said the neighborhood will flip. And he said, Let, suppose I want to have uh, retail on the first floor. I'm going to have offices on the next two floors. I'm going to have um, mixed-income apartments, some, some market, some uh, affordable. And on floors 13 and 14, I'm going to have luxury condominiums. And the reason I'm going to have luxury condominiums, can you imagine this, is because there's nothing else, and the views are stunning, right? Back over the city and out over the, uh, out over the harbor. And he said the community will be inflamed. And they will say, you are going to drive up property values so that we, our rents are going to go nuts and we can't live here, right? And we've all seen this um, play out. And what happens, the city comes in and referees a compromise, and the city says, okay, you, you have to... You, you have to take off your top two floors um, and you have to make a payment to the, um, you know, maybe build a little park and make a payment to the um, neighborhood association and then you can build it. And he said, now suppose the economics work at 12 stories 
two. And you go back and say, I still want story 13 and 14. And I will take the value of that delta and give it to the community as equity in the property. So that in some formula, you know, geographic or the community group is a trust or something like that. He said that the, the reason he's thinking about this is because what happens is, in these kinds of developments is we end up debating how to preserve pockets of poverty for poor people rather than how to lift people out of poverty. So suppose they have a stake in the thing. By the way, we're dealing with this right now with the Obama um, uh, Foundation Center in, uh, uh, in Chicago. I just saw that last time. Yeah, same, same point I've been making there. Suppose we, may, we create a way for people, you know, yes, there's going to continue to be pressure on rents, but that owner might actually be able to buy that building from the value of the equity in that, uh, uh, in that, um, in that uh, um, project. It's a very different way of thinking about um, an, an investment of that kind in a community uh, uh, like that, and I'm looking for how to try that. Um, and I haven't, it, we can't quite do it within our fund, but we just added uh, a real estate fund, so we might be able to do it in combination with them. Yeah, 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 sorry. Is this the shy side of the room over here? <laughs> the questions are. When you go to school at Kaufman, you come out with, the answer to everything is go in and create jobs and create wealth for communities, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of, a, it's beaten in. If you stay there long enough, it becomes a part of you. And, um, you know, what's interesting coming back into the ecosystem in Kansas City, after being out of it for 10 years, is how much developed. When I went to work in the late 90s at Kaufman, no one had ever heard of venture capital. When I tried to say, oh, I work on the Kaufman Fellows Program, there was one VC firm here in Kansas City, and it, and it no longer exists. Mm. Um, what's interesting, though, coming back in is that the, the ecosystem has really uh, become quite sophisticated, and we've got a lot of things, interesting things going on. One of the things that's cool about Boston, there, I connected with um, a woman at Mass Ventures, yeah. which is such, so this, seed fund that we're building is an evergreen, is designed to be an evergreen fund, right, right. capitalized, maybe with a little bit of civic money, mm -hmm. uh, but, but capitalized almost entirely by donations, mm -hmm. really trying to prove to the community, we don't have that appetite yet for the really early stage investing, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and trying to kind of prove to the community that you can do good, you know, that you can invest early mm -hmm. and still see some return. Mm -hmm. Mass Street Ventures is a 40-year-old evergreen fund that's returned $96 million dollars. In and of itself, it started by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Yeah, right. It's real. I mean, the way it was, yeah, capitalized yeah. is really interesting. Yeah, and there are there. Are, I think it's such an interesting time in venture because there are some really, what you're doing on that kind of upper at that later stage mm -hmm. is so interesting. But so is what's happening at the earlier stages. Ohio with what the state of Ohio's done with mm -hmm. the frontier mm -hmm. and the money going into different kinds of models. Mm -hmm. to, we to, to really we there's a there's a lot of power in public partner public-private partnerships. And there's my question for you. Is how, yeah, what do you think about There's that? a lot of power in it. This is, this is another um, way to think about uh, answering your question. We did, um, we created something called Mass Challenge, which is a, yeah. an incubator, yeah. uh, business incubator. Uh, we put in $5 million of state money uh, as, a, as a sort of an anchor grant and then private investors put in, uh, matched, matched it and exceeded it, I think, by a factor of four. And that was in, that was 10 years ago now, in the worst of the recession. It's the largest business incubator in the world today, um, with operations in Massachusetts, in Israel, in England, in Mexico, um, soon in Austin. And it's, 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 again, about creating this culture. And it, it takes no stake, which I think is one of the reasons it's grown so fast. Um, very competitive. Um, there have been a couple of unicorns that have come out of it in that, uh, in that time. But back to creating this culture of trying things. You know, let's try a bunch of stuff. Um, don't throw money at it, you know, because it's like in the Life Sciences Initiative. It's scientists who make the decisions. <laughs> About, uh, about where those investments should, uh, uh, should go. These are venture folks, venture, venture experts and entrepreneurs who make the decisions about mass challenge, not, not folks who don't have that expertise in, uh, uh, in government. But government has its role to play, and that's, that's what we tried to do.
going to make this actually our okay. last question. Okay. So, I'll so, take one for the team. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> so From the shy I side. Felt, yeah. I can. Uh, I graduated in 2016 and with John Deere. Mm -hmm. And my question is, you talked about sustainability, uh, health and wellness, and community building. And mm -hmm. one of the things you talked about was closing the skill gaps. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could expound upon that a yeah. little more, just yeah. from a manufacturing standpoint. Costs are rising because we can't find skilled workers. No kidding. So yeah. I'm just trying to understand that. Yeah, so if I answer your question well enough, can I get a discount on a tractor? I, I, I want, yeah. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm shopping for a tractor. Um, so the, the, in, the mid, in the midst of the recession, we're a smallish state. Uh, in the midst of the recession, we had, I, I think I'm right, 170,000 people looking for work mm -hmm. and 125,000 vacancies, right? right? And what the employers were telling us is what you just said. They can't find the people with the skills they need for the jobs they have. Right. And we have a, um, you know, the, I, I don't think it's just us. I think it's true of many states and it's true nationally that the training money, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of training money in government um, in various buckets, but we have um, a kind of a train and pray or a train and hope thing. You know, you train people in some skill and hope that they will find a job rather than connecting the job to the necessary skill set and then a, a way for an, a, an individual or a couple of individuals to come in, get that skill set, and then train, and then transfer onto that job. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a clever term we had for it, but I can't rem remember now. But we enlisted the community colleges to, to help us with that, um, to try to get at that, uh, at that uh, skills gap. And because what we were finding is that a lot of those employers needed um, more than a high school diploma, but not necessarily a college degree. Mm -hmm. It might be a certificate um, in some discipline that was pertinent to that particular job. Um, and uh, that's right, learn and earn. That's what it was called, learn and earn. And so we were having employers say, listen, I need you know, a, a dozen engineers, and they have to have this um, uh, skill set, and, and you know, here's a curriculum. Uh, that is uh, that helps us, and they would together with us screen the um, the applicants. Folks would come in and get um, at low or no cost a uh, a, cert a certificate, and then go right into that job. And in many cases, we're doing internships in that job while they were um, completing the uh, the certificate. The companies we're interested um, in, there's one company in particular that we're focused on that has an online. Uh, vehicle to get at this and um, they have a, a, a large online education presence today at the um, high school and college uh, uh, level and we think that this is a it there's an application to the skills gap um, sort of, uh, regionally specific same kind of thing talk to the employers find out what they um, what they need what's that skill set develop with them that curriculum and make it um, accessible and affordable without debt to, uh, uh, to people who need those opportunities. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Does that get at it? Yeah. 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 Still no discount? Yeah. <laughs> no. We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll Good. Be back to go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.